Welcome to Community Bible Study, Lake Jackson, Texas class. We're in John chapter 12, lesson 17. And that's where Jesus was anointed by Mary. He entered Jerusalem to shouts of Hosanna. And he predicted his death and lamented unbelief. Well, I attended the funeral Saturday uh, virtually of my dear friend who died of COVID. It caused me to reflect on what constitutes a life well lived. Well, we believe that there is an absolute authority who has seen fit to tell us what constitutes a life well lived. That absolute authority is God himself, the creator of all life. Jesus came into the world to reveal that to us. Turn to John chapter 12 and come and see that God the Son tells us a life well lived for God's purposes is not only well lived, but brings God glory. The first section is where Mary anoints Jesus at the Bethany feast in his honor, and that's verses 1 through 11. Look at verses 1 and 2 as I read it. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at a table. It's six days before the Passover. Mary puts an expensive ointment on Jesus' feet at a dinner given for Jesus and wipes it off of his feet with her hair. <clears throat> Verse 3 tells us the purpose is anointing. Anointing is usually a time of celebration. Verse 2 implies that the dinner is given in Jesus' honor, most likely for his displayed divine attributes by raising Lazarus to, to life. Well, certainly the dinner is a celebration of Lazarus' life and a celebration of Jesus' display of his authority and his power over death. Well, Judas ruins the mood. Verse 6, we're told, because of his greed. John tells us that Judas, Judas is a thief and that he's in charge of the money bag. It's interesting putting a thief in charge of a money bag. Well, other gospels tell us that the other apostles joined Judas' criticism. In verse 7, Ju Jesus rebukes the disciples. Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Jesus knows his death is imminent. Although no one questions the comment, John evidently remembered it, probably at the Holy Spirit's inspiration when John wrote this book. A large crowd comes to Bethany because Jesus was there but also to see Lazarus, the man who had died. In verse 11, because on account of Lazarus, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus, the priests condemned Lazarus to death too, because the people believed in Jesus. Given the evidence of the raising of Lazarus, the man who had died is a threat. The people are believing in Jesus and following Jesus and no longer following the priests. Well, the central idea is that God is glorified when we fulfill his purposes. Consider Lazarus being involved in Jesus' life, ministry, and miracle. It brought him notoriety, but also a death sentence. Following Jesus... Fulfilling God's purposes is contrary to the world's purposes. The question and our challenge is, will you and I choose to glorify God by fulfilling his purposes, even if it comes at a cost? Let's go into the second section, and that's about the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Verses 12 through 36. Look at verses 12 and 13 as I read them. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
even the king of Israel. Well, it starts out with the next day. So it's five days now before the Passover. In verses 16 through 19, Jesus enters Jerusalem seated on a donkey. A large crowd expecting and looking for Jesus, the man who had raised the dead, they hear that he's coming to Jerusalem. The Messiah, the eternal king, the savior is coming into the capital. Well, their expectation is shown in the palm branches they're waving and casting in front of Jesus and their shout of, of Hosanna, which means save now or save us. They are expecting Messiah to bring peace to save them from foreign oppression. But curiously, the Messiah is seated on a donkey, a symbol of peace, not a war horse, ready to take on the armies of Rome. Well, John quotes Isaiah's prophecy here, indicating that Jesus is the fulfillment of that prophecy. All of the disciples, and John included, did not understand them at that time. It wasn't until Jesus had been glorified that he realized the fulfillment of the prophecy. And that was, again, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In verses 18 through 19, the Pharisees realize that their machinations are powerless. The world has gone after him. We are gaining nothing. Well, their words are ironic. John tells them in verses 20 through 22, that some non-Jews worshiping at the Passover feast request to meet Jesus. God's intent is for the Jewish nation's rejection of the Messiah. As the Pharisees put it, the world going after Jesus, it's the beginning of the church age. The Jewish Messiah is the savior of the world after all. In verses 20 through 26, Jesus' response to the Greeks' request is the grain of wheat analogy. He says, truly, truly, this is a profound truth. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. A person who dies to self, they give lordship of their life over to God's lordship. They give their life. They uh, God's plans, his will, and his purpose becomes their plans, their will, and their purposes. Their will, their resources, their time, their efforts, their service, they keep it for eternal life. Anyone who serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will be my servant also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him and they bear much fruit. And we're told that God, the Father, will honor that person. Jesus also says, whoever loves his life loses it. Those who love their lives and hang on to their lives, they love their own will and own purposes, they lose everything. Jesus' servants, they follow him. They are true disciples. They are where he is doing his work, doing God's will. Look at verses 27 and 28. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. But we're told it's five days before the Passover and that that is Jesus' hour and it has come. In verse 27, he says his soul is troubled, but Jesus' resolve is to execute God's will. His purpose for coming to earth is to die for mankind's sins and to be resurrected. Jesus' response to his troubled soul is, Father, glorify your name. Jesus chooses to glorify God. He chooses the glory of God, not to ease his troubles. In verse 28, God the Father's immediate, thundering, audible response is, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. 
in verses 23 or 29 through 33, Jesus's reaction to God the Father's declaration is that he tells the disciples, God the Father's audible, thunderous declaration was for your sake, not for my sake. He also says, now the hour is for judgment of the world. Remember those who believe in Jesus are not of the world. So the judgment of the world is not for us. However, the world stands judged. The consequences of personally rejecting the Savior is judgment. Jesus also says, now the hour, the ruler of this world, Satan, will be cast out. In verse 32, Jesus says, I draw all people to myself, not just the Jewish nation, all nations. In verse 32, Jesus says, when I'm lifted up, and John makes a parenthetical comment here. He says that this statement signifies that Jesus is going to be crucified on a cross. Jesus knew the type of death that he would experience, not stoning as the law calls for, but Roman crucifixion. In verse 35 and 36, the light of the world, God's revelation of himself, in Jesus, we're told, will be with them only a few more days. Jesus' plea in light of his leaving is believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Well, again, the central idea is that God is glorified when we fulfill his purposes. Our challenge is glorifying God by choosing to fulfill his purposes. In verse 36, there's just a short comment that says, when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Jesus supernaturally disappears again. Let's look at the last section, and it's all about the unbelief of the people. And that's verses 37 through the end of the chapter. Look at verse 37 with me. Though Jesus had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. In verses 37 through 43, John comments on the irrational, incredulous unbelief, the rejection of, the, of Jesus, given the evidence of his divinity. Everything that John has written about in chapters 1 through 12 that we've been studying for the last few months, those were given in evidence and incredulously the spiritual leaders of Israel and Israel as a nation reject and choose unbelief. The miracles he performed, his words, his knowledge, his wisdom and insight, his authority that he demonstrated, his character, his grace, his mercy, his empathy, and his love for his people. Well, from this, I found a sobering principle. God hardens the hearts of those who continue to choose to reject the clear evidence of the Savior, those who choose not to believe Jesus. Well, in verses 42 and 43, some Pharisees did believe in Jesus, that he is the Christ, but they chose to hide it due to the threat of excommunication and perse persecution. They chose man's favor rather than the glory that comes from God. In verse 47, Jesus' purpose in coming into the world is to save the world. In verse 44, whoever believes in Jesus believes in God the Father. Jesus is the exact representation of God the Father, and he is the only way to the Father. In verse 46, Jesus came into the world as light, so that whoever believes in him may not remain in darkness. And the last thing is that Jesus came to save the world, verse 47. Jesus' word will judge those who reject him. Jesus' words are on the God, God the Father's authority and at his command. And the commandment that Jesus has received from the Father and given to us 
is eternal life. Well, the world has been given evidence that Jesus is the Christ. And mankind has two choices, either believe Jesus or reject Jesus. God is glorified when we believe Jesus. Jesus' purpose, salvation, is fulfilled for that person when they believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that person receives eternal life. God's purpose for us is to believe in Jesus and then to follow Jesus and then to tell everyone else about Jesus. Well, again, the central idea is that God is glorified when we fulfill his purposes. Our challenge is choosing to fulfill his purposes and glorifying him. So who will you tell this week about Jesus and bring glory to him? Let's close in prayer. Jesus, thank you for being our savior. Help us now to have the confidence and the desire to boldly tell everyone else about you. Well, I hope you had a wonderful time uh, and enjoyed the study of John chapter 12. Uh, the next few chapters are going to be really difficult as we look at Jesus' death. But there's a celebration at the end. Well, I really miss everyone and look forward again to the time when we can get together physically but until this, that time comes, we'll see you again next week.